My name is Tony Kukic, and I'm here to introduce your presenter, Remus Viscurda. Uh, Remus has been a teacher and dear friend of mine for 40 years now, and he has touched the lives of countless other artists throughout his career. Remus was born in Lithuania and became a naturalized citizen shortly after arriving in the United States at the tender age of seven. His first college degree was in science, and his first job out of school was as an associate physicist doing research and development on solid rocket fuel at Aerojet General Corporation from 1966 to 68. And so, he's a rocket scientist. <laughs> Remus went back to school around that time thinking that he wanted to become a teacher. And he received an MFA from California State University, Sacramento, and then an MFA from Washington State University. Around this time, he also started a pottery with his friend Dick Hotchkiss. One of their most famous collaborations became the Earth, Air, Fire, Water Ceramic Workshop, where along with the workshop participants, they built and fired the largest Noborgama-style climbing kiln in the Western Hemisphere. This is a kiln that's still fired today. And uh, uh, many of you know Remus also from his alias, Captain Ceramics. Yeah. <clears throat> right? As Captain Ceramics, uh, Visgerda gave us such wonders as the world's most powerful potter's wheel which was powered by a 455 cubic inch automobile engine. <laughs> he also manufactured many time-saving and convenient products for the busy potter, such as pre-centered clay, <laughs> and Kiln God the Father, Kiln God the Son, Kiln God the Holy Ghost, and my favorite, Mary, Mother, of Kiln God the Sun. <laughs> Remus has taught at uh, many colleges and universities throughout his long career and has taught too many workshops and done too many artist residents for me to mention here. Um, his work is shown nationally and is in collections here and all around the world. Um, and he continues to work and show as evidenced by his presence here. And so, without delay, please welcome your presenter, Remus Fitzgerald. Thank you, Tony. And uh, thank all of you people for uh, coming, not knowing what you're getting into. Uh, cure for the pure, what does that mean? Uh, I think to understand what it means, you need to know a little bit about me. And Tony told you some details, but I can elaborate a little further. Uh, I found ceramics during my science studies. I stumbled into a ceramics class my freshman year as a physics uh, major and really liked it and took to it and found time all through my uh, undergraduate degree uh, to take a, uh, a class each semester as an, as an elective. So by the time I graduated as a, a physicist, I could do pretty well in ceramics. And through a uh, number of uh, events after science, I wound up moving up into the Sierra Nevada foothills, uh, <clears throat> close to Grass Valley, California. And my, as Tony said, my friend Dick Hotchkiss and I started the H&V Pottery. Uh, we were making pots, and we were, we were wholesaling pots. This is like the 1970s, late 60s. We were wholesaling pots to a candle maker who uh, uh, would order like 2,000 at a time. And so we got, I got pretty good at throwing. We, to amuse ourselves, we tried closing, uh, throwing with our eyes closed, uh, throwing backwards, uh, just anything to, uh, 
take away the tedium of having to make 2,000 uh, single little pieces. Uh, we did summer art fairs as well as the wholesaling stuff and uh, I got lonesome up in the foothills. And my friend Dick, his stuff seemed always to be better than mine, which really didn't bother me, but what did bother me is that he seemed to know why. <laughs> and and he, had this, he had this graduate degree and I thought, well, I'd like some company. I'd like to go back down, to, down the hill to uh, Sacramento and uh, go back to school and find out some things. So I went back to uh, Cal State University and started taking classes uh, for a Master of Arts degree. And after about two years, it's a one-year degree, after <laughs> about two years, my uh, advisor said, you know, shouldn't we uh, maybe count up your credits? And I said, well, yeah, okay. And they counted up my credits, and uh, before I knew it, I, was, I had way too many, and got kicked out the door. And I, and I had such a good time in school, in the studio, uh, surrounded by people that were serious about what they're doing, that I realized I just had an MA, a Master of Arts. And holy mackerel, I could get an MFA. I could keep going to school. And so I applied at Washington State University, and I got a teaching assistantship, and everything was fine. And after my, at the end of my first year there, all the other graduates were uh, sending stuff out, writing letters and stuff, and I said, what's that about? And they said, well, we're applying for teaching jobs. That's what you do when you get an MFA. And I said, really? I said, okay. And so <clears throat> at, the end of, at the end of my, uh, stay there, I wrote, I think, maybe three nice letters and sent them to the universities that I would like to teach at. And I got diddly squat. So then I looked up a list of all the universities in the United States and blanketed them with uh, <laughs> uh, information about me. Uh, I missed some things about Sacramento. In Sacramento uh, were, were my formative years. Uh, my uh, ceramics teacher was Ruth Rippon, and from her I learned my uh, techniques. How to fire kilns, uh, scraffito, wax inlay, glazing, glaze over glaze, uh, and it was all high fire uh, kind of stuff. The other person that had a big influence in my early career was Bob Arneson who taught at UC Davis just across the river. And from Bob, I learned about ideas. I learned that art comes from personal experience and uh, things that you know and things that you uh, feel strong about that have part of your life. And so at this point, I would like to give you some advice to you that are younger. Travel, go to a foreign country experience something that you can't experience in, uh, where are we? <laughs> <laughs> Minneapolis. It's not much different from Portland or LA or New York. Uh, when I was going to school in Sacramento, I used to go to the De Young Museum in San Francisco, and I loved the uh, uh, Korean carved celadons. They're just gorgeous. They, they glow, but if, you look at the, but if you look at the foot, the foot isn't white porcelain like we normally would like to think of porcelain, but it's kind of a dingy gray. And uh, that didn't look very pure. It looked like there was some kind of, yeah. It wasn't as clean as we like our porcelain today. Uh, And so I thought, you know, uh, how can I uh, put some life into my clay? And one of the things that I found is some of the uh, uh, visiting artist gigs that I've had at schools, there's a wedging table for porcelain, white clay. There's a wedging table for stoneware. There's a wedging table for terracotta. And the three shall never meet. And so I started wedging my porcelain on the terracotta table. And I liked that. It gave it a... Uh, 
a little more zip, maybe, something like that. Uh, after my MFA, I lucked into a teaching job. Just stumbled into one at uh, Millican University in Decatur, Illinois. And I started to, who would? <laughs> and started to formulate my ideas. Uh, and those of you that want to go into teaching, I have a tip for you. When you get your first teaching job, go to lunch. That's where all the decisions are made. That's where the other faculty get to know you that are going to vote on whether you get tenure or not. And uh, I never did that. And so I've taught in Illinois, uh, twice in Minnesota, in <laughs> Iowa, in California, and back to Illinois. Okay, back to uh, Cure for the Pure. Uh, when I was formulating my teaching ideas, I thought that uh, ceramics could have a, an, an analogy in the, real, in the real world. And that is that, and that is I, I tried to uh, uh, relate ceramics to the real world. Talk louder. And this is, this is a mannequin. And mannequins are made to be perfect. They're symmetrical, they're smooth, they uh, represent a person, but they have no character or personality. Whereas a person, this is my son, Jonas, uh, is weird. Is, he, <laughs> One ear is lower than the other. His his mouth slants. Uh, his, you know, if, 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 his head isn't centered over his neck, and 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 what that does is it gives a person character or personality, and that's what makes every two people uh, be different. Okay, and so thinking about ceramics, this is really a nice uh, soup plate. But it's, and it, yeah, it's nice, it's white, it's smooth, it's elegant, but uh, you might want to jazz it up and some people choose uh, color to make things more interesting. And that's one, one way to do it. Uh, this is a very elegant bowl. It's beautiful in its simplicity and its roundness and smoothness, but once again, it doesn't really have character or personality. Uh, and so I, I'm thinking about, uh, I've been doing drawing and uh, some printmaking, and you can do a drawing on a piece of copy paper, and it has a certain look, with, you know, uh, Sharpie and some colored pencils. Or you can do that same drawing on a piece of arches paper, and all of a sudden that paper starts to interact with the drawing and, and makes it different. Or you can use a piece of paper that's uh, Japanese handmade rice paper that has bits of stuff in it and uh, it really changes things. And so I started to put things into clay to change things up. Uh, my first teaching job uh, it was a small university, and I also had to teach figure drawing. And I had never taken drawing in college, <laughs> so that, that was a challenge. And uh, uh, so I, got, I, I found a book called, uh, by Nicolaides called The Natural Way to Draw. And I read the first chapter, and I stopped right there. Uh, and it's about contour drawing. And so all my work, uh, oh, you know, back to the beginning, ideas in, uh, uh, that I learned from Arneson have to do with uh, uh, narrative. You tell a story, and it can, it, it can be as simple as a still life, or a, uh, or, a, or a country scene, or a figure, or whatever it is that you want it to be, but it needs to be about something. And uh, this is a piece that uh, is basically a contour drawing. What I do is I uh, uh, get a, well, make the thing, and then get it bone dry, 
and then with a uh, very uh, soft pencil, I sketch out the drawing that I want. Then I wax the whole thing. And uh, when the wax dries, I take a scratching tool and I scratch through following those lines and I inlay a black material. And it's called wax inlay. And this is a clay that uh, we used to make in California and it has these uh, specks in it. And I think those specks add to the, uh, uh, interact with the drawing and add a certain uh, element. And they come from, uh, the H&V pottery days where we uh, dug our own clay in the Sierra Nevada foothills. It turns out that uh, mountains can be hydraulic away by the gold mining uh, thing until they get the clay and the clay gums up the sluice boxes and the, and the things that they can get gold from and so they stop mining and so what they have done is taken away all this stuff and exposed enormous amounts of clay. And this is our clay pit. Uh, here we are digging it back in the day. And this clay is very short. It's got a lot of sand in it and it's not uh, very plastic at all. Luckily, about 30 miles down the road is a place called Lincoln, California, where they mine a clay called Lincoln 60. It's a fire clay that is very plastic. Uh, and so we uh, combine the uh, raw clay that we dig with Lincoln 60, throw in a little ball clay, and uh, we have a very nicely workable clay, except it's really bland. And so we dig, dig up some dirt, some red dirt, and uh, process it into uh, small bits and add that to the clay. And it comes burning out through the glaze and making spots uh, in the image. Uh, my work is about color and line. I already talked about line, but back in the uh, 60s, Bob Arneson was starting to work with low fire things. And I, uh, I say that my work is about color and line. And I've taken a line drawing and introduced color by lustering it. Most people don't know that uh, luster comes in many colors. It's not only gold and platinum uh, and found around rings of, uh, or the lips of cups, but it uh, also has colors. And this is a clay at my first teaching job that's made with uh, AP Green or Hawthorne Bond and uh, some uh, uh, gold art and some ball clay, and uh, it, it just naturally has some impurities in it and causes those little flecks that appear, uh, like uh, there's a few in her hair and there's one on her back and uh, stuff like that. Uh, I sent out a, 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 a feeler to try to find other people that put things into their clay. And this is Mark Eisenberg who found a, uh, a, a site near his studio that he digs up and he's found that uh, it's, it has a lot of manganese in it. And so he will take that manganese and uh, sort it and refine it into, uh, into a gravel and add it to his clay. And uh, without glaze, and probably looks like maybe a wood fire, this is what it comes out looking like. The, uh, the other person that sent me some uh, slides is Louis, Louis Katz from uh, Texas. And here he's uh, taken bits of copper wire and put them in the clay. And they uh, come out as these black spots and things. I think that if he were to uh, use a porcelain and maybe a glaze, a copper red glaze without any copper, and glaze that piece, that porcelain piece, with that, that he would have like red spots or uh, black spots that have a red halo, which could be uh, really pretty beautiful. Other things that you can put in, or a standard thing that you can put in your clay is grog. Grog is usually added to clay for a couple of different reasons. One, it gives the clay some strength. It's like the, uh, it's like the, uh, 
the aggregate in, in concrete, it gives it some strength. It also helps the, uh, the clay to dry. And grog can be uh, had in very many grades or sizes. Uh, here are two grades that I have. I have it's a, uh, what I call a, a small and a medium. And if you put it into a white clay, it shows up as a barely visible yellow speck because it's so fine. But the difference that it does make in the quality of the line that you get from using wax inlay. The, uh, I forgot to mention that that, uh, that blue rim platter, uh, the, the clay had very little aggregate in it. And so the line was very smooth. But if you put a, put uh, like a small sand into it and wax it and then drag a tool through it, it'll pop out pieces of sand. That's what you see on the piece on the left. And if you use a larger aggregate, it pops out bigger pieces. And for me, I call that activating the line. And I really enjoy that active line. And so we can put uh, a darker thing into a light thing, grog into white clay. Uh, this is Mark Richardson, who actually does the reverse. It's white clay into a terracotta, and then he sandblasts it to reveal the white specks uh, that are there. This is some uh, grog in, uh, that comes from Lithuania, which originally originated in the Ukraine. And uh, there's a symposium in Lithuania where they uh, work for five weeks, uh, invite artists, and the, the clay comes in from the Ukraine, and uh, it's offloaded the uh, train cars, and then half of it is fired in, uh, to cone 13, and then that's taken out, and it's gone through a, a series of uh, hammer mills and stuff and sorted into seven different sizes, and this is the largest size, and then they make a clay out of a, a finer grog and uh, the, the clay itself. And, uh, and it's all really nice and white with, with specks in it. But uh, I'm not sure why I put this slide in here, because I haven't done anything with it yet. <laughs> uh, but in China, I found uh, another material, quartz, that uh, uh, doesn't really melt very much, but gets sort of soft and kind of comes starts to want to creep out of the clay. And uh, if you put it in a dark clay, it becomes very apparent. But if you put it in a white clay, it's not very apparent at all, uh, except for the part that I've uh, uh, covered with black slip, because it'll come crawling through the black slip and uh, uh, texture and give a texture to the surface. Uh, this is the back. And this is uh, another type of line that I like to use. Uh, I invented this line, and I call it uh, wax out. It's where I'll, I will take a bone dry piece, and I will use that soft pencil and make a drawing. Then I wax everything but the line. And I get what I think is an interesting line, like if you see the uh, the, the, the wave uh, at the edge of the hair, it, it, it wanders from thick to thin because you can't control the wax to keep a very even uh, thickness for, uh, for when you put the, the black in. This uh, is some material that I got from a person that works with uh, colored clays, Chris Campbell. And she sent me three sizes of uh, material. This is the fine size and the coarse size, and this is the middle size. Uh, she sent me enough to do two test drives with the middle size, and this is one of them, and uh, this is the other one. And I'm thinking to uh, to make some of my own uh, colored bits to put into uh, the clay. I'm thinking just to make a uh, porcelain slip, take, a, take porcelain and slipify it, and then uh, dump a bunch of stain into it, mix it up, roll out a thin slab, let it dry, and uh, biscuit, and then start breaking it up and sieve sieving it to the size that uh, I'd be interested in. 
This is something that I found in uh, uh, Missouri. A guy named Russ Small Smalljohn taught at a uh, university in Missouri, and I uh, passed through once, and he made his own grog. Uh, the pile on the left is vitrified, the pile on the right is bisque. And uh, the difference between the two is if, uh, if your grog is bisked, your clay will shrink around it up until the bisque temperature. Then they will go up together and keep shrinking. So you get a minimal amount of cracking on the right. But if your grog is vitrified, your clay will continue shrinking uh, up until cone 10 when both are vitrified and you get the uh, condition on the left. And then I take and uh, I enhance that, uh, those cracks by painting uh, black into them and washing, them off, washing it off and then firing it on. And once again, this is the bisque grog. You can see the different sizes that, uh, that I use and the back of uh, bisque grog and the front of bisque grog. The, uh, when you uh, do the wax inlay, it catches on pieces of grog and pops out a portion of the line, which is what makes the line have those spots in it. This is vitrified grog, and the back of the vitrified grog, and the front, which has a lot more cracks, and so the, the, uh, uh, the surface is much more active. And uh, so, that has to do with the title, right? Cure for the Pure? It's not pure anymore. It's uh, been cured somehow. Uh, in Tennessee, I found, years ago, I found uh, chicken grit. This is uh, stuff that they feed the chickens. And uh, I bought a 50 pound bag 20 years ago. I've still got half the bag left. Uh, <clears throat> because it was a lot of chicken grit. And uh, chicken grit, you want the kind of chicken grit that's granite, because granite will melt. Ba out back west, uh, uh, on the west coast, they have chicken grit, but it's usually crushed, crushed seashells. And if you put those in your clay, what happens? It falls apart. Right, so you need to be careful about that. And then Lewis Katz actually told me about uh, a, a, a slight difference. This is chicken grit or poultry grit that I, uh, I took the picture off of Amazon, but they also make chick grit. And so you can get uh, uh, granite in different sizes. And uh, this is... Uh, 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 a bowl that Lewis Katz made that has the chick grit in it. Uh, the, the granite, the, the, the mother rock, uh, a lot of granite, not all, has uh, iron in it as part of the rock. If it doesn't have any iron, then it bleeds out, it melts and bleeds out as a white spot. If it has uh, iron in it, then it bleeds out as a dark spot because of the, uh, of the iron. And this, uh, this is, these little pieces are uh, uh, made with uh, uh, that big old Tennessee chicken grit. Uh, the piece on the left is uh, reduced, uh, gas fired. The piece on the right is uh, uh, electric fired. And so the, the reduction firing gives, a, gives a, a white clay kind of a cold aspect and electric firing gives it more of a warm warmth uh, aspect. The problem with putting chicken grit in your clay and then putting it on a kiln shelf is it sticks to the kiln shelf. And this is the back of those two pieces. I have a, I have a diamond burrs at home that I, and, and a Dremel tool that I then uh, clean up the back. This is chicken grit in a porcelain factory in Poland that's fired to cone 13. And uh, with my science background, I figured out how to make it not stick to the shelves. And that's by using a clean piece for the bottom. <laughs> 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 
sharp, huh? <laughs> and uh, this, this is the, that old Tennessee chicken grit that's uh, been in a salt fire. And what, what the glaze does, it tends to soften it. The, uh, this, the, those, those uh, spots are kind of pretty hard and they're, they're, they're like a, a bubble. The uh, salt covers that and tends to uh, subdue it a little bit. Uh, because I, wor I work with lusters, I also found a uh, really, uh, for me, exciting thing to do, and that is to put uh, chicken grit into a, a, this is a tile piece. Uh, this is a, uh, comes from uh, Fredericks of Hollywood catalog from the 1950s. Is uh, yeah, when, when I was in junior high, I, I used to uh, look at the magazines on the uh, <laughs> drugstore rack. And uh, a friend of mine was collecting magazines, and uh, they had a lot of those old ads in them and said, hey, you want those? I said, you bet, I can do something with them. But the thing that's exciting about that is that the, the granite that bleeds out is shiny. And the clay is matte or satin. And so you wind up with shiny bits on a satin ground. You get it? <laughs> Nod. OK. What cone is it? What cone? I fired a cone 10, 10 or 11. In the, I, 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 I've been to a lot of porcelain factories in Europe, and they generally fired a cone 13. And so uh, 13 isn't enough to make that granite run, but it just makes it a little meltier. These pieces are fired to cone 10 and, uh, at home. Uh, the, uh, w when granite, uh, <clears throat> when you have a granite face like in a road cut or something, you will find a bunch of rubble down at the bottom, <coughs> down at the bottom of, of that face. And uh, you can collect that rubble and uh, break it up further. And I have uh, three screens that I process it through, a uh, three-eighths three inch screen, a quarter inch screen, and a window screen, which is a, an eighth of an inch. And uh, this is, that's what it looks like on the left. That's the, uh, that's the rocks that I pick up. And the way that you can tell whether something is decomposed granite is you take two softball-sized pieces of uh, that rubble, uh, one in each hand, and you slam them together. And if your hand really hurts and rings, <laughs> that means they're still granite. <laughs> but if they crumple, then uh, it's, it's decomposing. And you can pick that stuff up take it to your studio, break it up, and sort it into sizes. This is uh, uh, in situ on the, on the left, a uh, uh, large size in the middle. And what I get, uh, I used to break this up with a hammer. And uh, I made the mistake once of dumping a bunch into a hammer mill. And I got a five-gallon bucket of dust. Uh, yeah, this is what happens with uh, the decomposed granite that I found, or I was led to, is in the uh, Angeles Forest outside LA. And it happens to be a, a granite that has very little iron in it. And so the stuff that bleeds out is, uh, is clear. It's like a, a clear pearl, like a little clear glass bubble. Uh, the, uh, on the left is the finer size, on the right is a little larger size. And uh, this is what the medium size sort of looks on a piece. Once again, you have that shiny spots on the gold. And uh, I remember uh, I was in a show with, uh, with a friend of mine, Phil Cornelius, and uh, had a piece similar to this. And he was explaining to someone that, oh yeah, that I took, uh, uh, I painted each of those little uh, shiny bubbles uh, d separately uh, to make them gold and shiny, whereas uh, actually it's a trick. You just uh, slop it on, and there you go. And if you use a glaze, then the glaze will absorb 
that decomposed granite and smooth, smooth out so it's not, uh, not rough. So that's the medium sized decomposed granite. And here we have the dust. I have so much dust, I started putting it into my clay. And it acts sort of like, a, uh, like sand or grog uh, and bleeds out in these tiny little uh, bubbles. The, uh, and so uh, in nature, we go from granite to decomposed granite. And when decomposed granite com decomposes further, uh, you get feldspar. And feldspar is a powdered material that you usually use in a glaze and as a melter at, uh, at high temperatures. But uh, a friend of mine, John Williams at Trinity Ceramics, found that you can get coarse feldspar. And here we have two sizes of uh, the court, coarse feldspar. And this happens to be custer. Uh, which is a common, and, and if you uh, ask, uh, call around, the decomposed granite, you go have to find yourself, and then you test it to see, to see how it goes. The uh, coarse feldspar you can usually find at some ceramic supply house or another. And uh, this is the uh, fine uh, coarse feldspar, and uh, put into a piece that is fired to uh, cone 13, and it bleeds out as a white pearl. The decomposed granite that I have bleeds out as a clear pearl. This bleeds out as a white pearl. And I find that it becomes more apparent if I luster it with rainbow opal or pearl luster, because then it starts to get kind of an iridescence, iridescence and becomes more obvious. And here's a similar uh, Fredericks of Hollywood uh, image, but this one is with the uh, Custer feldspar instead of the uh, decomposed granite. But it basically does a, a very similar thing. And this is what it looks like on a piece. Uh, Mark Eisenberg also gave, uh, sent me some slides of things that he puts into clay. And this has uh, brake rotor filings and, uh, and, and small bits of Custer feldspar. The brake rotor filings are iron, and they make the brown spots, and the white spots are the uh, uh, fine Custer uh, little chunks. And this uh, apparently has a clear glaze on it, and if you put a, uh, uh, a colored glaze or a dark glaze on it, and here he's used larger Custer feldspar chunks, they come bleeding out, and the, uh, uh, the iron spreads uh, into the clay. And uh, this is the super coarse feldspar. And if you put that into your clay, you get something like that. And once again, you can enhance its uh, visibility by glazing it, or uh, yeah, by uh, uh, coating it with uh, pearl luster, or mother of pearl luster, and firing that onto a low temperature. Uh, this is sand, and sand also comes in uh, various grades. Uh, if you, sand is basically white, it's quartz, and uh, if you put it into a light clay, it doesn't show up, it just kind of disappears. But it will affect the quality of the line if you're doing a wax inlay. Fine sand on the left, a coarser sand on the right that activates the line. Uh, I also tend to uh, pick up materials as I travel. And in Mendocino, uh, I found a beach that had this black sand. And I gave it a test drive. Uh, <clears throat> and this is it fired to cone 13. And the uh, little black bits do melt. And the white bits sort of uh, come erupting out just a little bit. Uh, one other person that sent me slides that actually I have uh, some material from is Lee Rexroad at Ed Edinburgh University. And Lee uh, has a laborious way of making colored feldspar. He will take a crucible and uh, put feldspar powder in it like you, you use in a glaze, and then he'll dump a bunch of uh, uh, stain in it. 
and melt the whole thing and in a, in a furnace until uh, it's liquid. Then you take it out with these casting tongs and you pour it into a, a big bucket of water and it shatters and breaks up. But then you break it up some more and uh, size it uh, with those sieves to, uh, uh, to get whatever sizes you want. And uh, this, is, this one isn't very exciting. I don't think he's added any stain to it. It looks just like uh, uh, feldspar. Maybe it's got yellow stain, I don't know. Uh, and here's another piece of his that he did. When I, when I was visiting Edinburgh, uh, I, I was doing some demonstrations and I made a piece with some uh, cobalt feldspar that he had made. And uh, this is what that looks like. Uh, big, blue, shiny spots that are, that are oozing out of the clay. And uh, that's about as impure as I can get. And so I think uh, we're done for today, uh, except I want to give a shout out to uh, Tony Kukic, who gave my introduction. He's an uh, old and dear friend and uh, lives in St. Uh, Paul, Minnesota. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.